If you're a guest with us, I'm teaching through the Gospel of Mark, and we're in chapter 3, so you're, you're here early and got a lot of Mark left and glad that you're here. Um, what we've seen thus far is Mark is a very fast-paced book. Uh, it moves from piece to piece very quickly. And uh, today we, we see two little stories that fit together, and I'll, we'll take a look at those. But I, I wanted to just make a couple of comments, and this is primarily for those who sit in the balcony that uh, are a bit introverted, and that's not the only reason you sit in there. Some of you came in late and like to sit up there, but introversion is a real thing. Some of you are introverted, and, uh, and some of us are not. I'm somewhere in the middle, a perfect balance as a human, I'm quite certain. <laughs> Um, but it hit me as I was reading through these last couple of chapters, studying through them, how introversion would have been a real problem in Jesus' life had he been given to it. Uh, he, he, he can no longer go into the cities and preach because the crowds are overwhelming. And that happened after he healed the leper. And now he's moved out into the rural areas and he's preaching. And the crowds continue to be overwhelming in the tens of thousands. They're coming to him for healings, and they're coming to him uh, to hear the message, and they want to be fed, and there's a lot of reasons that they're circling around Jesus, but they just press in on him. You remember last week, he told his disciples, he said, we're going to go to the seashore, you bring a boat so I can get away from the crowds. He felt that he was going to be crushed by the crowds, literally, if he didn't have a boat to back off into the lake and begin to preach from the boat. So he's around crowds all the time. And then when he gets away, he, he's now chosen 12 disciples that are with him almost 24 hours a day. And I don't know how that would go for you, but that would not work well for me. I would be impatient, I'd be short-tempered, I would be sinful, none of those things Jesus was. And so even in his down times, he's around 12 and he's probably around hundreds that are following him in a more, you know, communal discipleship setting and then there's the tens of thousands around him and I thought it's just it bears down on him all the time it's always people and he you'll see from time to time he draws away he, he goes to be alone with the father and I've noted before if he needs to do that we need to do that um, but it's a difficult I think it's a difficult earthly ministry that Jesus is undertaking just at that human level of pressure all the time. Well, today's no different. Let's pick it up in, in verse 20 of chapter 3. And he's just chosen the 12. He went up on a mountain and he sun, summoned them to himself and he chose them and he wants them to be with him so he can send them out. We talked about that last week, that that's the role of a disciple is to be with Jesus, being prepared to be sent out with the gospel. So now in verse 20, he's come home. They've come down off the mountain. They've come to Capernaum. Home from this point forward in the last couple of chapters is always in Capernaum, and it's, uh, it's uh, probably Peter's house. He says, And he came home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent they could not even eat a meal. And when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, He's lost his senses. So here we find Jesus, he's come down off the mountain with the disciples, he goes to Peter's house, it's dinner time, and there are so many people from the community crushed into the house that they literally can't sit down and have a meal. There's no room, there's no time, the demands on him are constant, and Mark just makes the observation, you know, I'm sure Peter's filling him in on this, that we couldn't even sit down and have dinner. Our, our feeding schedules were thrown off by the crush of the crowds all the time. So you think about what this is like. Jesus is literally forfeiting his own well-being to minister to those that are in his presence. And those that love him, his, his, uh, his own people, it says in verse 21, when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying he's lost his senses. Who are his own people? I think the context of chapter 3 indicates who these people are. If you look over in verse 31, it says, Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him, and they called him. 
And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So imagine now Jesus, word has gotten back to Mary and to Jesus' brothers and sisters. In fact, if you're curious, turn over to chapter 3. Well, I'll just read it to you. Chapter 3, verse 3. He's back in Nazareth, his hometown, teaching now. And it says, Is this not the carpenter's son, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So we know that there's at least four brothers. Uh, Joseph might be a cousin. And there's at least two sisters, because they're spoken of in plurality. So four brothers, two sisters, and his mom show up in Capernaum to save him from himself. They have reached the family conclusion that he's, he's losing his mind. Now you remember, he has been confronting the religious leaders of the day, those that hold the power in the world in which they live. And this confrontation has not gone well. Lots of pushback, lots of persecution, it's going to get worse. I'm sure the family at some level is saying, the harder you push against the religious leaders, uh, the worse it's going to be for us. So Jesus, you, you are not thinking correctly here. Now remember, Mary is a Jewish mom. And I've, from what I gather, Jewish moms like to cook food for Jewish kids. And she's worried about Jesus' physical health. And so they have traveled from Nazareth here, and they want to take him. They, they really want to take custody of him because they sense, as it's put here, that he's lost his senses. I want to stop and just note that Jesus rarely has the luxury of being understood. The religious leaders don't understand him. His disciples, those closest to him, are always scratching their head and asking obvious questions, and they don't understand him real well. The crowds don't understand him. All they want from him is healing or a demon cast out or free food. They're not terribly interested in his message, the message of repentance. But at least his family understands him. No. His own family doesn't get it. Now, there's no indication that his brothers and sisters at this point have placed their belief in him as the Messiah. They've got a lot to overcome, that their older half-brother is claiming to be the Messiah, and he's pushing against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, and he's stirring things up in their world and community. They're scratching their heads going, what is wrong with our brother? And of course, he was a unique brother to begin with, having never sinned, having always walked in the will of his father. But they don't understand him, and they want to come save him from himself. The luxury of being understood is a luxury very few of us get to enjoy. In fact, if you think about broken relationships, broken, struggling relationships that you have right now, my guess is if you track things back, if there were a third party there, you'd recognize there's a great deal of misunderstanding. It's not clearly as black and white as it appears, that there's misunderstanding, and that misunderstanding leads to confusion and leads to broken relationships. And so here's Jesus, just like us. He is not being understood by his family. Now, I don't believe, my personal belief is that Mary has not forsaken the faith. Mary understand he's, understands he's the Messiah. She has been swayed by her other children, and she is concerned about Jesus. I mean, she, who wouldn't be? And so she steps in as a mother. She's brought along as the, with the rest of the kids to, to you know, strengthen the case of Jesus. You've got to come with us, because if you don't, you're beside yourself. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to starve to death. The crowds are going to get you. The, the Pharisees definitely will come. Let us take control of you. Let us have custody of you. Let's sign the papers over and we'll, we'll take care of you. And Jesus is saying, he's think, I don't know what Jesus is thinking. What I would be thinking is, man, this is frustrating. My own family doesn't understand me. I don't know if you've been in that position because of your faith. Some of you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you came from families that had no interest whatsoever in spiritual things. 
your family was going merrily along its way, pursuing its own course, its own purposes, giving no thought to a relationship with God, maybe, maybe not attended church on Christmas and Easter, and you heard the message of the gospel, and it resonated with you, and the Spirit of God did a work in your heart and drew you to himself, and you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you've believed in your heart, and you have been saved from your sins, and you went back to your family and told them this, and they think you're nuts. There are some in the room that that was your immediate experience to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there are some here today that that's your continued experience. 10, 15, 20 years down the road, people still, your family still does not understand what it is you believe and why. They don't like the fact that you have changed. They don't like the pressure that you bring to a family that once was able to enjoy life and sin together. Now you have changed and your obedience to Christ is evident and they don't like that. If that's you, you're in very good company. The good shepherd the Son of Man, God incarnate, knows how you feel because that's how he felt. Maybe you came from a very religious family, a very structured family. They were a part of a religion that had a lot of formality to it. There was clear parameters for you, and when you heard the gospel, you hadn't heard it in that context because often it's not there. But when you heard the gospel and responded to the Lord Jesus Christ, you recognize that the religion in which you were raised is not the religion that follows the Savior that you have believed in. And so you've backed away, you've stepped aside. Some of you maybe did that graciously, others of you maybe did it very abruptly. But your religious family now views you as a fanatic. And they see you completely different, and if they're adherent to their religion, they probably see you as lost. Push come to shove, they had to make a decision about your eternity, they'd say, no, you're, you've stepped out of the faith. You've done this new Jesus thing. We, you know, we love Jesus, we, we believe in Jesus, but... And then they start adding more things that the church tells them to do. And so their faith in Jesus, it's a different Jesus. Their faith in Jesus is not the faith that he's called for. And so because of that, you now are separated from them, and you live in this unique no-man's land within the context of your own family. Being understood is a luxury that very few get to experience. And so here, Jesus is, again, he understands how you feel. This is his case, is for sure. This is a Jewish family to the core and he now is claiming to be the Messiah and teaching a different kind of repentance and faith. And Mary understands it, but she's swayed, but brothers and sisters at this point do not. And they're going, I, what are you doing? You're putting us, our family, against the powers that rule the world in which we live. We need to take you away. We need to feed you. We need to put some sense into you. Take heart. That no matter how broken a family your situation you're experiencing, no matter what kind of estrangement is going on because of your faith, Jesus can understand it. He can feel it and he can empathize with it. Well, there's a third kind of family I want to address here and that's, that's probably more common in here. I, I don't know if it is. I just like to say things like that. <laughs> and that's families that are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've heard the gospel and believe it. They've repented of sin and self-righteousness and turned to Jesus. They're investing in their faith at some level. They raised you up in the faith. This might be to you college students. And you sense God's call on your life in a different way. Maybe you're sensing that God is calling you into some kind of type of ministry. Maybe the mission field. Maybe the pastorate. It might even be something as, who knows what God is calling you into. But your follow, your, your Jesus-following Christian brother and sisters of parents and family, they don't like it. They, don't, they had a different plan for your life. Their plan involved that degree they paid for. 
And that degree should have been led to a career, or that, that you, you're supposed to come back and run the family business. What, whatever it is, they're saying, hey, we love that you love Jesus, but can you just tone it down a little bit? Can you not consider this? Could you, could you think about something else? I mean, you could make a lot of money in the family business and give it to missions. And, and they're not understanding what it is God is doing in your heart. That's a tough place to be as well. And if you're there, I'm sorry. It's the reality sometimes of how families relate together. Now, I would give this one word of caution. Your family knows you probably better than anybody else. And if they're saying, I don't think you'd be good at this, that's one thing. You know, if I'd have gone to my parents and said, Mom, Dad, I want to open up a ministry to chemists in high school, if I'd have said this to them. They'd have said, really? What, what would you do? He said, well, I would become a famous chemist, and I'd try to reach other chemists for Christ. And all they'd have to do is take my report card and shove it under my nose, say, do you see your chemistry grades here? There's not a vowel present anywhere in there. You can't spell a word out anything here. Brett, you're not a chemist. Uh, truer words were never spoken. So they would be you know, issuing wisdom. You know, we're all for you having a ministry, but it's not to chemistry folks. Have you ever th thought of, you know, so there's a difference between I don't sense that you're gifted for this, you're suited for this. I don't know that this is really what you're wired to do. That's different than I want you to succeed on my terms. I want you to use that degree. I want you to take the business. I want you to be secure financially. I want you to have all the things over here that aren't going to be provided over here. Now, that's a lot to draw out of the fact that Jesus is misunderstood by his family, but I think the reality that we live in, in the family world in which all of us experience to some degree or another, is often filled with misunderstanding, and sometimes it's filled with downright animosity over your faith. And Jesus gets it. He understands it. Let's go back to the end of the passage, verse 31. It says, Then he said to his mother and brothers, then his mother and brothers arrived. So in 20, we're hearing they're coming, and Mark is putting the story together. In 31, they're outside the room. They can't get in, which is frustrating them as well. Mary's concerned about Jesus' well-being and his food and health and all that. And so they're outside the, the house, and they send word, and word gets relayed in, and it comes to Jesus, and they say, Hey, behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And he answers them, he said, he turns and he asks a rhetorical question. He said, who are my mothers and my brothers? He knows who they are. That's not the point. He's trying to say there are two kinds of relationships on this earth. There are those that are strong family ties, those that are built on same blood coursing through our veins, but there's a stronger relationship than that. And this is what he's getting at. He, he looks around at the disciples. There's, the 12 are sitting around him, and then there's others that have been following him, and he looks at them, and he says, Behold, these are my mothers and brothers. Verse 35, For whoever does the will of God, he's my brother and sister and mother. Um, I think Luke records it or Matthew records it. Whoever hears the word of God and does it, he's related to me. She's related to me. Jesus is not forsaking his family. In fact, they, James and Jude would come to faith and be tremendous leaders in the church. He's not denying his family. What he's saying is, is I can't let my family stand in the way of my father. My father has a plan for me, and that plan involves going to the cross and dying for the sins of the world. And if I get sidetracked by my family, I will not accomplish what God has called me to do. And what's more important than even blood relationships is the blood relationship of Christ. And, and we have a deeper, 
bond with Jesus than we do with our own family because when we hear his words and his spirit prompts us and we obey, we are his brothers and sisters. We have done what he's called us to do. So I don't know where you find yourself in relationship to your family, but I hope that you find yourself connected to Jesus in the familial way he's talking about here. That he can look around and see us and say, ah, here are my mothers and my brothers and my sisters. Because that's the relationship that matters and that's the relationship that counts. Now at the end of Jesus' life on the cross, he's hanging there looking at Mary, his mother, and he talks to John and he puts them together. He says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. He loves her, he cares for her, he meets her needs, she's on board. But he's still saying, there is a deeper relationship than family, and that is Jesus, that's me. Walk with me, obey me. How do I know that you love me? What's, what's his love language, as Lou said earlier? Our obedience to the Father, our obedience to the Son. So he's misunderstood there, but now talk about misunderstanding. Let's look at the next section. So he came, uh, the people heard, they said he's lost his senses. That's his family's conclusion. Verse 22, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebul. Um, he's cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Okay, so if being, misunder if being understood as a luxury, Jesus doesn't enjoy this luxury. So now the leaders from Jerusalem and the, and the scribes are... They're the lawyers. They're the, they're the ones that are jot and tittle in the law. They're the ones that make these kinds of pronouncements. And they have reached the conclusion, they've come down to explain to everybody with an earshot that Jesus is not doing this by the power of God. Jesus is doing this by the power of Satan. I think that's a fairly big misunderstanding. Their reality is completely turned on its end. They, they are so lost. Now think about, put this in context. He's, he's at least a year. He has been healing. He's been restoring sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, legs to the lame. Just last week he restored a hand in the synagogue. He's cleansed people of uh, leprosy. He's raised people from the dead. He's turned water into wine. If he hasn't fed people already, he will, as we read through the book of Mark. He's fed thousands of people just miraculously by the power of God. He's casting out demons everywhere he goes. People that have demons are flocking to him in this unique relationship, and they're in submission to him, and he's casting out demons. He is God incarnate, doing the works of God, and the religious leaders have reached the conclusion because if he's not on their team, he can't be on God's team. Therefore, he must be on Satan's team. They, they would attribute spiritual power to one of two camps, either God or Satan. And I, I believe Satan cannot do, never has done what God can do. He can counterfeit some hocus pocus here and there, but he cannot do what God does. He's not in their camp, so they're saying, you're not in our camp, you're in Satan's camp. They use this, this term here, uh, uh, Beelzebul, and in case you're interested, that means uh, prince of the evil spirits. It's also interpreted sometimes as the god of dung. You could say the lord of the flies. Say, uh, Jesus tunes it up, look just down a little bit further in verse 23, and he called... And he called them to himself, and he began to speak to them in parables, and he said, how can Satan cast out Satan? He says, I know exactly what you're saying. You're not calling me a demon. You're calling me Satan. You're saying, I am answering to Satan himself, that I am just... And he said, so he makes it very clear, this is what we're talking about. To, to reach that conclusion takes the deepest depths of spiritual darkness imaginable. To have watched Jesus do what he has done for a year and reach the conclusion, yep, yeah, he's Satan. Can you imagine? And here's, here's the, the thing. They are speaking for the nation. They are speaking for the religion. They're, they're there to clarify things. This isn't just some Joe 
Jew on the side saying, huh, I wonder if he does that by Satan. This is a, pro, a proclamation. Our findings are he's doing this by the power of Satan. Well, he calls him to himself, and he begins to speak in parables. And he says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he's finished. So he gives three little parables. These are the smallest parables you'll come across. And they're just boom, boom, boom. And they all say basically the same thing. A divided kingdom isn't going to work. Satan is not going to come in and throw out his own demons. He's not going to divide his kingdom like this. He's not going to split his house down the middle. Common sense will tell you a house split down the middle will not stand. He's not doing that. That's not what hap what's happening here. Then he goes one further. He says, verse uh, 27, But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, then he will plum plunder his house. Imagine someone comes to my home and wants to thieve and steal from it. Well, as long as I'm bigger than he or she is, or as long as I'm armed and they're not, or as long as I've got the advantage over them, they're not going to do anything in my home. But if they get the drop on me, if for some reason they're able to handcuff me, well, then they've got to deal with Ferris. If I'm handcuffed to my chair and I can't do anything, they can do whatever they want to my house. Who's more powerful in this position, the thief or me? That's the thief. Now, Jesus is not equating himself to a thief, but he's using a common illustration. He says, I, there's no way I can come in and mess with Satan's affairs unless I'm stronger than Satan. I am stronger than Satan. I am the Son of God. I am the Son of Man. I am the Messiah. I am God incarnate. I am not Satan. I'm not one of his workers. You've got this all wrong. So he's really clear on this. And then he utters this statement that, well, I'll read it. 28. Truly, I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. Okay, I want to stop right there. This is a passage called the unpardonable sin, because we're going to get to this sin here in a second that's, just in, un, that's unpardonable. But I don't want to skip over that verse. That might be the best verse in the Bible. I don't know. That's a pretty good one. Let me read it again. Truly. When Jesus says truly, you know what he means? This is true. <laughs> what he's saying there is Amen. Before he makes the statement, he's amening his statement before he can make it. When he says, truly, truly, he's saying, make no doubt about this. This is not speculation. This isn't my theory. This isn't wishful thinking. Truly, this is true. I say to you, some sins shall be forgiven. Now, that's not what it says. All sins shall be forgiven, the sons of men, that's us, and any blasphemies you utter. Let's stop there. Pause there for a second. You realize there is no sin, none, that cannot be forgiven. Now, I know there are people in this room that struggle being forgiven, experiencing God's forgiveness. I said it last week. I, I'm old. I'll repeat myself. Some struggle with forgiveness because they don't think they're sinners. More likely you struggle with forgiveness because you think your sin is beyond forgiving. Let's read that again. All sins shall be forgiven. There is not a sin that can't be forgiven. Well, you say, well, what about murder? Well, what about murder? David's a pretty good example of that. And Jesus, God declared David has a man after his own heart. He murdered Uriah and 
had adultery with his wife, Bathsheba. So adultery and murder, those are taken care of. What about, what about the guys that nailed Jesus to the cross? The ones that literally killed him. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Can you think of one worse than that? I can't. There's some bad sins out there. Some terrible sins, but I'll tell you what. Jesus says, truly, without a doubt, bank on this. Every sin shall be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. I could stop right there and it'd be a fantastic place to stop. And the reason he's saying this, first, because it's true, but secondly, because he's marching toward a cross, that someday he'll hang on that cross and he will take the wrath of God for me and for you. He will take the judgment of my sins upon himself. He will take my sentence and fulfill it for me so that I can have his righteousness, his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace, his peace, all the things that he possesses we get because he takes all the things that we have upon himself. Don't miss that. So there's only one reason to, to say I don't believe God can forgive my sins. It's not a theological reason about is, is my sin too great. That's dealt with. The only reason that we would believe God can't forgive our sins is because we love our sins so much we don't want to deal with them. We don't want to go to him with them. We don't trust him. We, we like our sin or we like our autonomy or we like something about our life and we're unwilling to go to Jesus to receive the forgiveness that he tells us right here is available to any for all sins. Hebrews tells us it's for all time. So it's not a theological issue as is there a sin too big that God cannot forgive? No, it's a personal issue of am I willing to believe him and trust him and give my life to him? But you may be saying, okay, well, wait a second, there is one. Let's look at that, verse 29. It says, the, truly, truly, I say to you, or truly, I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven, the sons of men, and, whoever blaspheme, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Well, we'll finish that up next week, but let's, uh, all right, I'll finish it now. First, what's blasphemy? Uh, blasphemy is speaking against a word to speak against God. It's a an expression of defiant hostility toward God. Everyone in this room has blasphemed. If you've used the Lord's name in vain, if you've shaken your fist at God because you haven't gotten your way, if you've doubted God's wisdom and judgment and sovereignty and think you know better, those are all at the core of blasphemy. Jesus says those are forgiven. In fact, in Matthew, he says, you can blaspheme against me all day long. Well, he doesn't encourage that, but he says you can, and that'll be forgiven. But here he says, wait a second, blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, and we've got a real problem. So what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? I'm going to give you three senses of it. The first one is the literal one we're seeing here. In this context, in history, during the first century, people are walking with Jesus physically, and they are seeing God demonstrate Jesus, God, demonstrate power, literally, and they reach the conclusion, he's Satan. They have denied the revelation of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus is filled with the Spirit of God, and what he does is a reflection of the Spirit of God as well as a reflection of himself. And the Spirit of God illuminates the hearts of man and brings this to our attention and when we reach the conclusion, no, I don't believe it was done by Jesus or by the Spirit. I believe it was done by Satan. Literally, they have they blasphemed the Spirit and said, I don't think you did that. I don't believe what you're showing me. I want no part of this. It's, it's all of Satan. So if you take it in the literal sense, you and I weren't there. We will never be there. We will never see Jesus physically heal people and do the things that he did then. So we can't commit this sin because we weren't there to commit it. Secondly, 
It involves responding to the illumination of the Spirit of God. God's Spirit gives us insight, and we reject it. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have not rejected the Spirit's leading. You're here today. You're obedient to Christ. You have come to faith in Him. You have not rejected the Holy Spirit's illumination of your heart, His drawing of you to faith. That's why you're here. That's why you're a follower of Christ. There has never been a Christian that has blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Those two things are oil and water. They cannot happen. A follower of Jesus Christ cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is in him or her, and and she has believed. Now, she might doubt. She might struggle. She might shake her fist from time to time. See how I turned this on women all of a sudden? He might shake his fist from time to time, but that's not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You have, the Spirit of God has revealed the truth of God to you, and you have responded. You cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And lastly, if you're sitting there worried, how many of you, I won't ask for a show of hands, I will raise mine. Have I ever worried, have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? What does that look like? Of course I have. You read a passage like that, you better give it some thought. And you go, okay, well, So let me just tell you this. If you're worried about it, you didn't do it. Because you do care about God. You you see him as holy. You see him as just and righteous. You understand that there's judgment involved when we sin against him. You don't want any part of that. You're worried about it. You've never done it. So the believer cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Can the unbeliever? Let me talk about that real briefly before I close. If the sin is to reject the testimony of the Holy Spirit to deny the deity of Jesus, to refuse to believe in the truth that's been revealed through the Spirit of God, unbelievers are in the midst of that right now. That's what makes, us, what's what makes a person an unbeliever. Is I see the evidence, I read the Bible, I hear the sermon, I listen to my friends, I see their life change, but I, I don't believe it. I don't want to believe it. Now, is that forgivable? Absolutely it is. Repent, believe. And boom, the Spirit of God indwells you, you're forgiven, and you're adopted into the family of God, never to be separated from Him again. But as long as you walk down that path, you are in the spirit of unbelief and rejection, and the moment your heart stops beating and you move from temporary life to eternal life, there is no turning back, and it becomes an unforgivable sin, the only unforgivable sin. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, all sins shall be forgiven. If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ... No sins will be forgiven. So it's the unbeliever that eventually, at death, in his or her unbelief, commits the final unpardonable sin because there is no opportunity for a second chance according to the Scriptures. But right up until the moment of death, you can repent and turn to Jesus and you've not committed the unpardonable sin. You've placed your faith in Him at the 11th hour and you'll be received into the kingdom like the rest of us. So really what makes the unpardonable sin is unpardonable is the fact that you are treading a a path, you're unwilling to tread a path that leads to pardon. You're finding a reason to step off the path and not believe. You're rejecting the input of the Holy Spirit. You're you're turning against the conviction of your own sin. You're, You're not wanting someone to be your Lord. Do you want to be your own Lord? There's something there that keeps you off the path to pardon. Because if you walk the path to Jesus, he will forgive all sins. Don't step off. If you're not on the path today, if you're not a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, these words are strong and they are from Jesus and he says they are true. Don't trifle with them. He's calling you to belief. His spirit is prompting your soul. Don't push him away. Respond, repent, believe. We're going to move to a moment of, of communion now. And I think I've just described, well, in my mind, I have just described how communion works. If you're a part of the family of God, if Jesus would look at you and say, there's my brother and sister, my mother... Communion's for you. If you've walked the path that leads to... and by, when I, I meant to clarify that. Walking the path is not doing something. It's believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and followed him and said, all my sins are yours, 
please forgive me. Communion is for you. If you're wrestling with should I or should I not follow Jesus, communion is not for you. Because what communion is representing is his shed blood covering, atoning, propitiating, forgiving our sins. We are underneath his blood and we recognize that it's his blood and his blood alone that satisfies God. And if you haven't been able to do that through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, taking communion would be duplicitous. It wouldn't be something you'd want to do. Now, it doesn't mean you're shunned in our church. We're glad you're here. Nobody's keeping track of who's going forward or not. But the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, communion is for those that have become a part of God's family. And if if you're a part of God's family... You'll always be. There's no separation because we're saved by his grace, not by our works. So we're going to take communion. We're trying to do something a little different. The worship team can come up, by the way. Uh, We've set out more tables. There's two there. It looks like there's three there. There's three over here. There's three over there. There's two up there. Uh, What we're trying to do is create a space, an environment, where you can be a little more reflective about communion. Um, we've maybe gotten into a pattern or a habit where we just stand in long lines and, and go to communion, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we're trying to give opportunity to do it a little differently. So if you would like to be a little more thoughtful and pause at the table, if you'd like to go up with family and gather together and pray there, you're welcome to do that. Um, we're going to extend the communion time a little bit to give those kinds of opportunities. And so don't just stand in a line if that's not... There's, there's more tables than there have been. Is that making sense? Uh, we'll, we'll give it a try and see how it goes. What we're trying to do here is just give a bit of a different experience around the table that's a little more thoughtful and a little less processy. Okay, Let me pray for us. Father, as, as we look at this passage, we are grateful that we're in your family and that Jesus looks at us as his brothers and sisters. We're thankful for the families you've placed us in. Help us to shepherd them well, guide them well, love those that don't yet love you, live in a way that's pleasing to you. So we want to do that. But I think most of all today, I'm really thankful for verse 28 where Jesus, you tell us, all sins shall be forgiven. And then you faithfully walked in obedience to the Father to accomplish that task on the cross. And so we stand before you clean and pure and forgiven and guilt-free and and, and secure. We don't have to worry about an unpardonable sin that can't be committed by us. We just stand before you and thank you for what you have done. Now we go to the table and it reminds us of what you've done. It's this physical parable really it's a it, we see bread that represents your body and we see a cup that represents your blood and we gather around as a family and we partake in that and we remember and we don't want to forget we'll never forget we want to remember so bless our time around this table pray that it'd be a blessing and bring you glory because salvation is based on your glory not ours and we are so thankful that you have provided it for those who ask. And we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.